John 13, 31 through 35. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little while longer. You, look, you will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As most of you know, I enjoy the game of golf. Not a mystery to anyone here, as I know many of you do as well. Um, this past week, a week ago, the, the, the probably the highlight of the golfing season, the Masters Tournament. But what you may not know, anybody watch any of the Masters Tournament for a little bit? Yeah, okay. What you may not know is the Masters Tournament is actually the tournament that honors amateur golfers. It is a tournament that uh, is one of the only, I think the only tournament that actually gives out a trophy for the low amateur. Now, they don't give them a green jacket, but they do give them a trophy. And does anybody know why they honor amateur, all amateur golfers? It's because of one golfer in history. Anybody know who that golfer might be? Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones is probably the greatest golfer ever to play the game of golf. Bobby Jones won 13 major tournaments. Bobby Jones is the only golfer who ever held all four major championships in the same year called the Grand Slam of Golf. And Bobby Jones helped build Augusta National where the Masters Tournament is played, and Bobby Jones was an amateur. In today's world, nobody really wants to be called an amateur. In fact, today's world, amateur is sort of viewed almost in a derogatory way. Ah, he's just an amateur. Now, that was an amateur performance. What is this, amateur night? Right? But did you know that the word amateur actually comes from the French verb amare, to love. It comes from the word to love. And so in the earliest days of golf, it was felt that playing golf for money was beneath the dignity of the game. But originally, amateur golf uh, didn't refer to anything, anybody's economic status or privileged position in society or a protected club membership. It referred to those who played for the sheer love of the game. So, amateur status, for golf originally anyway, was not something embarrassing. So when Jesus here is saying his final goodbye to his disciples, he in a sense is saying to them, whatever you do, whatever, wherever you go, whatever you try to accomplish, never give up your amateur status. Do not become a professional Christian. Never allow it to be uh, uh, about anything other than love. When it comes to being the church, be an amateur. Not in the sense of doing things in a sloppy way or doing them badly or doing them in a haphazard way, but where love stays central, where love is your motive, where love is your drive and message and purpose. So Jesus is... Um, only hours away now from his arrest and ultimately his crucifixion. Chapters 13 through 17 of John are called the upper room, is called the upper room discourse. It takes place during the final meeting of the disciples in Jesus. The final, his final opportunity to talk with them. His final, the final things he has to say. 
to his friends. First chapters 13 through 17 of John. And several times he says to them, Here's the one command you must not ignore. Here's the one thing you must keep in the center of everything you do. If you lose everything else, do not lose this. Love one another. If you remember earlier in chapter 13, remember he gets up and he washes their feet. So he begins with this kind of very dramatic illustration of compassion as he walks around, bending over with a bowl and a towel, washing the disciples' feet from one to the next. You remember how dramatic and how quiet it must have been in that room when he did that. See, there was supposed to be a servant present to do that job, but nobody volunteered to be that servant for the disciples. So Jesus gets up and washes every one of their feet. And then he says this, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set an example that you should do as I have done to you. And then chapter 15, he'll, he'll say again, this is my, that's 13, then in 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than, than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And then our passage. This is the way people will know that you are my followers. This is the way because you love. Because you love. Don't let moral superiority or theological accuracy or political ideology or social correctness or organizational expertise or anything else overshadow your commitment and dedication to be a community of love. I like that he says, love one another, because it's way easier to say, love the world. It's a, it's a, it's a good saying and a kind of a noble gesture, but you know, what do you do about that? But one another, that's the person to your left and your right. That's specific, particular. So Jesus says, protect your amateur status. Make sure you put love first and do not let anything take that place. Just don't let it. Don't get sidetracked. So we started this series on Easter Sunday. We're still celebrating Easter. All the eggs are gone and uh, all the bright colors maybe and uh, but we're still here in the church talking about Easter, and we, we started talking about the, the fact that Easter was, was not meant to be just sort of this past event that we're nostalgic about, but that it was meant to be lived. It, it, resurrection was meant to be incorporated in the very fabric of our being. And so we spend seven weeks, 50 days in Easter talking about how does that happen? How does that work? And so that's what we've uh, been doing. And today we're introducing this as the re- response to this resurrection event that captivated those early disciples. A new priority and a new freedom. Loving like Jesus loved. Loving without strings. Loving without conditions. Loving without limits. And loving without partiality. What would this look like? So I've been reading a book called uh, Leaving North Haven. It's a collection of stories, by uh, fictional stories, written by a Presbyterian minister, Michael Linval, based on his experiences as a pastor, but, but it's set in a small, fictional uh, Minnesota town called North Haven. And one of the chapters is called Our Organist. In the chapter, the pastor of Second Presbyterian church in North Haven travels to be a guest lecturer in a small uh, struggling church in the town of Lake Carthage. The church hasn't had its own minister since 1939. 
but a handful of people hold on, and once a month, the first Sunday of the month at noon, they have worship in Sunday school with uh, whatever minister they can convince to drive to Carthage Lake on that particular Sunday. 80-year-old Lloyd Larson and clerk and key leader of the group tells Pastor Dave on the phone that there are only 11 elderly members left in the church who all live near the church, and, but he promises they will all be there. He also tells them that they have an organist, Lloyd's sister-in-law, Agnes Rinstadt, the same organist they've had for the past 60 years. So when he shows up that morning, he sees the 11 members and uh, one additional attendee, Lloyd's grandson, whose name is Neil Larson, who recently moved up from Texas. Lloyd explained to him uh, that there won't be any bulletin for the morning. He just needs to announce the hymns when it comes time to sing. So worship begins, and he announces the first hymn to the congregation, number 204, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. And Agnes smiles at him, wigs slightly askew, and plays, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> they all stand and sing from memory. Yes. And uh, then, uh, then, just prior to the sermon, the preacher announces the second hymn. Uh, let's all sing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. And he looks over at Agnes, who smiled at him again, and plays, I Love to Tell the Story. <laughs> again, the congregation stands and sings... Uh, from memory with great enthusiasm. So the preacher gives his sermon, and, uh, and it was, happened to be on the Jesus' command to love one another. And after he's finished, he walks over to the organ and bends down and whispers to Agnes, um, Agnes, what are we going to sing next? <laughs> and she smiles at him and begins to play just as I am. After the service is over, Lloyd uh, comes up to him uh, and uh, and sort of apologizes for not uh, telling him uh, about Agnes. He says, you know, you don't need to tell us which hymns we're going to sing, just when we're going to (laughs) sing. He says, Agnes only knows those three hymns. (laughs) And so we always sing them. (laughs) Good grief, Lloyd, Dave says. You mean you've been singing these same three hymns for 60 years? (laughs) Lloyd responds, uh, Hey, look, we like them well enough. We all know them by heart. And, well, Agnes is our organist. A few minutes later, Lloyd's grandson, Neil, comes up to him and explains that Agnes is Lloyd's late wife's little sister. And Agnes has never been quite right, he tells him. He's never, she never really speaks more than a few words. But somehow, he said, 60 years ago, She learned to play those three hymns in one week when our regular organist left town suddenly. It was a moment of musical emergency, and she hasn't been able to learn another one since. Playing the organ this one Sunday a month means the world to her, he said. Aunt Agnes just about lives for the first Sunday of the month. Sometimes, he continued, I think it's mostly for her that they keep the church open. After a brief pause, Neil says, you know, the church asked me to play one time on a Sunday, but I turned them down, much to my grandfather's relief. You play, Dave asked? "Uh, Yeah, I do, said Neil. Uh, I'm a 1984 graduate of Eastman School of Music. My... (laughs) Last job was a large church in Houston, a brand new Casavant 102 ranks, four services each Sunday, he said proudly. But then I got sick. I've been HIV positive for six years, but it wasn't until last fall that it began to get kind of bad. The personnel committee figured it out uh, with the weight loss and the sick days, you know, unmarried. They told me it would be best if I moved on. Uh, but not until after the Christmas concert, of course. (laughs) Grandpa Lloyd was the only family member who would help me out and let me move in with him. I had nowhere else to go. To be honest, this little church is the best church I've ever been in. You know, Pastor, Neil said, 
These folks get it. You know that love one another part you were talking about? They get it. They keep Agnes, and well, they took me in too. Some nights during the week, I come into the church, and Lloyd lets me play the organ. It's been getting warm enough for them to leave the doors and windows of the church open, and people sit out on their front porch and listen to me play. I play Bach and Wildor and Ruger and all the stuff I love, and I can hear them clap from their porches. Even Agnes claps. I want you to know something Jesus said to his friends in this final emotional meeting. I'm going away. I'm going away. And you can't come with me right now. And I know you're afraid. But I'm not leaving you alone. I leave you my spirit and I leave you with one another. It will be hard sometimes as you go from this place to follow me and serve the world. But you can lean on, you can count on, you can care about each other just as I have cared for you. Whatever you do, whatever you try to accomplish above everything else, before everything else, be the place where love abides. Don't let any other good priority get in the way. Make that the thing that people talk about when they think of you. Writer and researcher Brene Brown in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, says this. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. We are biologically and cognitively and physically and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt others, we get sick. The resurrection was meant to make us people who love boldly, who take big risks in caring for others, especially for those in our society that can so easily be forgotten or neglected or mistreated. If you will do that, Jesus says, if you'll just do that, people will recognize that you've been following me. Love without condition. Love without exception and love without end. If you do that, people may even come out on their porches and listen to that beautiful music that will fill the air. And maybe they'll clap in approval and gratitude. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.